welcome to our last session of Interpretation of Tongues. This special subject that we're dealing with in this teaching is Interpretation of Tongues in the Church. Before we get to that, a couple of things I'm really excited about sharing with you. The book that I told you about at the beginning of the class, now it is finished. And you can order it from lmci.org. The name of it is Interpretation of Tongues, what it is, what it does, and how to do it. And what a, it's a fun book, one of the more fun books I've written in some time. So you'll enjoy the book. And we want to post these teachings on YouTubes and then encourage you to buy the DVDs from our ministry and specially use these in small group trainings. And uh, this is a perfectly wrapped, matched subject when you put uh, our teaching together, the booklets on diverse tongues and the anointing in and on. But we want to get these into your hands and make sure that the well that we have dug or redug, probably dug here, you know, is stays fresh and bubbling. And it, it really should. If you give your time to much prayer in tongues, diverse tongues will begin to really happen in your life. And you'll see what I'm talking about whenever it says it changes your prayer closet color to technicolor, like uh, what was that movie that had the um, Pleasureville, when you went to Pleasureville after you sinned, everything turned color. Well, that's not the case with this. But once, you, once you begin tongues a lot in diverse tongues, it will change colors, and your black and white prayer closet will become a living color, technicolor. One more thing I wanted to talk about before we get into interpretation to us in the church. Since we're doing this retake here in my office, we'll cut to the end when it comes to the examples of interpretation of tongues in the church. So when we get to the end, whenever you see the cut and paste at the end, it was from our class that we have recorded previously. So, but to catch you up on this, I'm excited to share with you one more thing before we get to interpretation of tongues in the church. I found some quotes from Oral Roberts and Kenneth Hagin about interpretation of tongues. And I would be remiss if I didn't share it with you. I have really stated a premise uh, largely in this class that the doctrine of interpretation of tongues is basically as it's done in your prayer closet and in the church. Not that it's not done in your prayer closet and only in the church. Mine is an inclusionary perspective of both in the closet and in the church. And I know that the majority of the things that we've heard taught about in interpretation of tongues is when it's done in the church. But it, and we're going to get to that. But how refreshing it is to hear two of the old age-old patriarchs and the old Pentecostal roots uh, talk about tongues with interpretation. Listen to this. And this comes from Terry Law's book, How to Enter the Presence of God. Good book. After Terry Law's wife died, he spent some time with Oral Roberts. And Oral Roberts said, you see that building over there? Yes, I replied. I was praying in the Holy Spirit and began to interpret back what the Holy Spirit was saying to me through tongues, he explained. When I began to interpret it back, the Holy Spirit said, you build that building, so I built it. I said, you're kidding me. Oh, no, he said. Every building on this campus came from the Holy Spirit in the same way. But brother, I said, I've been taught as a classical Pentecostal that you open yourself up to air if you start praying in tongues and interpreting back your own tongues and act like you have a hotline to glory. I've seen a lot of people get under air and get messed up doing that. Are you sure about this? He said, Terry, before God is true. The Holy Spirit revealed to me what Paul was saying in 1 Corinthians 14 when I began to trust the interpretation of my prayer language. All of a sudden, my mind started to get flooded with the good things of God. I couldn't believe what was coming out of my spirit. It totally blew my mind. Terry goes on to make a comment. I'm the one who says in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every truth should be established. So I spent the next week some time with Kenneth Hagin Sr., and I brought the subject to him. This is important. You know, these are men of God, uh, uh, of Hall of Faith, and uh, miracle men. Are you, here? are you listening to me? Miracle men. I mean, they plowed the ground and sowed the seeds of miracles that many of us are walking in the furrows still. Okay, but this is their foundation. So then he said, so we asked Kenneth Hagin, he said, Brother Hagin, I know that you pray in the Spirit a lot and you interpret back on occasion, but Oral Roberts told me that every building on that campus was given to him by the Holy Spirit after praying in the Spirit and then interpreting back. He told me he's been doing this for 30 years. Brother Hagin smiled at me and said, I've been doing it for 40. I can hear him say it. I've been doing it for 40. 
I said, you've got to be kidding. He said, oh, no, from the earliest time of my ministry, I'd be praying in the Holy Spirit. And according to what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, my understanding was unfruitful. I was speaking mysteries. I began to hunger and understand what the Holy Spirit was trying to say to me. So I began to pray to interpret. 1 Corinthians 14, 13. I began to, uh, I began to pray to interpret. When I began to pray to interpret, the Holy Spirit began to bring up, up in me the good things of God. My whole ministry is based on that. Every major revelation of my ministry has come out of that. I said, oh, my God. What has the body of Christ been missing? These are men of God, uh, of miracle fame. And I can just tell you, you know, I've done my share of them too. We're talking about the foundation of our faith, our relationship with Jesus Christ, our, our growing in our intimacy with Him, in our prayer tongues, in our private life. And I, I really believe if we do what Jesus did, Mark 1, 35, wherever, Early in the morning, went out a great while before day, departed a solitary place, and there prayed. Um, I, I, I'm really under unction in this, and as we release these teachings, I want to make it available to come and do trainings for you. I think the Lord has been really directing me to do this, to teach my people how to pray. And isn't that interesting? Because that's what the apostles and the disciples asked Jesus. Teach me how to pray. Well, we need to learn to pray in the Spirit with tongues and diverse tongues and interpretation of tongues. And that is true. And we're totally on board uh, with the interpretation of tongues in the church. And this is what we're going to talk about now. And as I said, at the end of this, we'll cut, we'll paste in some of the interpretations in the church that were done in our previous class that we'll paste into this. So let's talk about interpretation of tongues in the church. And I like to talk about this, but it needs some explanation. And um, I'm going to give that to you. And this is one of the, the first questions that you get. Well, in interpretation of tongues, do I interpret my tongues or does somebody else interpret my tongues? Well, first of all, I'm going to answer that. But the answer to that is yes, <laughs> that both of those are possible. And putting God in a box is not a good idea. OK, they tried it at one time. He broke out of the. Holy of Holies and the Ark of the Covenant, and now he's living in you, so let's not try to put him back in a box. But nonetheless, the operation of interpretation of tongues as a church is a viable operation in the church. Now, I want to talk to you about this, but I want to talk to you first of all about something I've recently learned. I just come back from visiting Ephesus and uh, Athens, 45 miles from, her, from where Corinth is from and studying the religion that was going on at the time of the writing of 1 Corinthians 14. Corinth was a city of commerce between the, it's, an, it's almost an inlet, between two major seas, and it was a major road of commerce through the world, that place in Corinth. These trade routes that people were traveling took them from all over the world, and what a great place for a revival. And yet, traveling through in the church in Corinth were people with many languages that they spoke. Now, if you think about interpretation of tongues in the church, stop for a second and go back to Pentecost, okay? The 12 apostles on the day of Pentecost, they spoke in the tongues of men and other people understood it. And this is a viable operation in the church even today, but we don't see it much in America the reason being is because the old saying goes, well, uh, a guy that speaks three languages is trilingual. A guy that speaks two languages is bilingual. A guy that speaks one language is an American. And so we don't understand many languages in our churches. And even some of the founding patriarchs that taught some of the foundations of interpretation of tongues needed a more international perspective and realized that really that, uh, that this is a viable option. However, you know, some of them did. Uh, many, there was, uh, I guess, a hundred or so uh, items that was chronicled on the Azusa Street uh, where people went to other nations and preached in diverse tongues to people in the languages of men, and that's how they started the gospel spreading in those places. So we don't want to limit that operation. You see, here's what was happening in the church in Corinth, first of all. They were indecent and out of order. People wanted to show off that they had a good tongue. This was the, this was the amphitheater, and, and the religion at that time was still greatly influenced by Diana the Ephesians and the controlling of the church 
was must have been an interesting thing because they were taught to be out of order. They were taught to be even lewd or rude. And so Paul was setting in order to a bunch of heathen pagans that had no roots in Judaism how to behave when they got together and they met and they fellowship together. And what a cool explanation that he gave for this. And so there were people there that spoke many languages. And one of the functions of interpretation of tongues, or I mean one of the functions of diverse tongues, was to stand up and speak in a tongue in the language and see if anyone there understood the language. And there was a time where you would pause. Okay? And then for someone to give the interpretation if they knew the language. And then if no one had that interpretation and they by the known language, then they would give the interpretation by the Spirit. So you see, that's why you understand it says if nobody's got the interpretation, let the two do it or three do it. If nobody's got the interpretation, just be quiet and let's move on to another part of the service. So anyway, we need to understand the operation of interpretation of tongues in the church, first and foremost from the heart of God. When the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14, how is it, brethren, in verse 26 of 1 Corinthians 14, how is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you has a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. Look here. Let all things be done unto edify. And this is the first and foremost thing you need to understand, that the church there was out of order in their behavior. Okay? And there's nobody who's trying to put a lid on the Holy Spirit, but they were trying to keep it in order so that people could understand what they were saying. Makes sense now, doesn't it? You know, with the bedlam and babbling that would go on in false temple worship. So anyway, Paul says, look, let's get the ego out of this. You know, and I get it. I mean, when I got spirit filled, I was probably very analytical <laughs> about my approach to Christianity, you know, and I was so forthright and overbearing and, and you know, oversharing. That was a new word for you. You know, in my approach to Christianity, I get the zeal. I understand this. But anyhow, if you got something good, you want to give it away. And so, but Paul was saying, first of all, look, okay, chill. Okay, you got a psalm. All right, well, sometime you can get it. Sometime you get to read a verse. Sometime you get to pray. Sometime you get to prophesy. What we see in church today, this is the best order of service that there is in the church of Jesus Christ today. Look at that. How is it, brethren, when you come together, the other one of a psalm, have the doctrine, have the tongue, have the revelation, have an interpretation, let all things be What better order is that? You know, and we're not main staging the announcements and the offering. <laughs> so... Or even, but you know, but there, you see the psalms, the singing, the doctrine, but when it comes to a tone of interpretation, look, you know, you don't, not everybody there has to do it because you know what will happen after two, or, after two or three messages, the message begins to reiterate. And, you know, God is, you know, he doesn't need to repeat himself. But, you know, maybe he does. But, you know, there is a time when this is happening uh, in the church and it's right. So let me address a couple of things here so that I can keep in step with the Apostle Paul, as the leader of a fellowship, there is a responsibility of maintaining order in that fellowship. And the mantle goes to you who has the leadership and you need to be lovingly authoritative in these issues. You don't need to be hard in these matters. But what happens is we expect people to understand how to behave and we've never taught them. So plug this in and, and play this in your mind and allow for the Holy Spirit to move in your worship services, in your church services. And would, don't you think it'd be a good idea to give the Holy Spirit an opportunity to speak? Or is it that we as the leaders have always got the message and we don't need to let the Holy... What did I say? That we don't need to let the Holy Spirit what? Speak? Yes. So don't stifle the gifts of God in the church. And I understand that they get messy. You know, and people sometimes say some stuff that's questionable. You'll live through it. But I tell you what, you won't even live if you don't go to it and to go through it. You know, so 
you got to get the Holy Spirit moving in these fellowships. But look, here's the deal, okay? And there, you should allow a time in the service for this to happen, okay? You know, and say, okay, look, we believe in the gifts of the Spirit. We want them released decently and in order. But you know, I'll tell you something else, too. If you're walking by the Spirit, by revelation, you can certainly see someone that God is working in to give a word, okay? That's completely acceptable in those situations. Like, would you stand up? I believe you have a word of prophecy. Is that right? Could you please speak in tongues and see what happens? And then maybe they give the interpretation or something else. You should have that right as a leader as well. But you see, the whole idea is let's let people have an opportunity to share. Let's let them have a psalm. Let's let them have a prayer. Let's let them have a testimony of what they learned that day at work. Let's let them have a tongue and interpretation. Oh my God, the joy, the edification. This is what we need in our church services, dude. <laughs> we need to be edified. You know, and, and really, really, I'd rather be edified than listen to boring preaching anyway. You know, but I, I, I didn't mean to say that in a, in a critical way, but look, we need to let God go in our, in our fellowships. It almost sounds like it's an insult. You know, that we have it. <laughs> well, anyway, so you see where I'm going with this? And, and that is, let's allow it to happen and teach what's supposed to happen. As a leader, you have no right expecting your people to know what to do unless you teach them. Okay, so you need to teach them to liberate them in interpretation of tongues. And man, have a great time in your worship. It'll just lighten up the whole place. It really will. So... When this takes place in the church, okay, we've gotten past the point where we're going to allow it to happen. The Holy Spirit is the prime mover in this, and it's not you. It's not the person. But I taught you in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11, but the one and self-same Spirit energizes all these severally as He wills, and that He is the Holy Spirit but that he is also the man that he has to be willing. You need to be pliable, you need to be usable, and you need to disengage your ego. And this is what was happening in the Corinthian church, perhaps by some people that wanted to stand up and make a, a show of, of what they had and how good they were or whatever. But if we let everything be done in the edifying, then all the wrinkles in the shirt gets ironed out on the first pass of the iron. So in the church, when this time, and it's time to be released, and you may feel the presence of God come upon you, U-P-O-N, I taught this in anointing in and on, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you may feel a real burden, and it may be a burden for you to pray in a diverse tongue. Anytime, remember this, anytime you feel the Spirit of God come on you, start speaking in tongues, and chances are it will be a diverse tongue when the Spirit of God is on you. Pay attention, and you need to learn to be sensitive. And, and you need to learn to be sensitive of this in your prayer closet before God takes you out on the highway, <laughs> unless you drive on the interstate. Remember the analogy? Anyhow, but we're talking about in the church now. Now listen to me closely. This is very important. Because when it says that in the Bible, if any man speak in tongues, pray that he may interpret. You know, this, then it says that he may interpret. And the same thing's true with prophesy, it, with prophecy, that he may prophesy. And the word may is used properly in the subjunctive mood because it implies, it, it says that a condition must be supplied, and the condition that must be supplied is the permission to use it. May I use your car? Well, the answer, you know, the answer is according, may I have your permission to use your car? It's a may I. Well, you may prophesy if the Holy Spirit leads you to do this. And I'm, I'm concerned about this, that there's times that this happens and we're not led by the Holy Spirit. I've been members of very influential societies and taken polls on the moving of the Holy Spirit. A lot of times we say 50% of it's flesh, 25% is demons, and 25% of it's genuinely God. Make sure that God moves upon you. I'm not trying to throw a wet blanket on your faith. I'm trying to help you grow in the operation and the understanding of the importance and the responsibility 
of this invaluable gift of interpretation of tongues. But when the Spirit of God moves upon you, then stay in that and begin praying in tongues. You have no idea what God will do for you, but stay in that. And then when there's a time for it to be released, raise your hand, do what you do, turn cartwheels, whatever you got to do. So is it a diverse tongue? Is it a prophecy? Is it a tongue with interpretation? You will not know until you open your mouth. And that is what you need to understand, that this is being led by the Spirit, not by you or by your ego. So, who interprets in the church? Here's the, here's the chart. The difference between the gift of interpretation and the ministry of interpretation. We don't understand this largely because we haven't seen interpretation operated uh, in a grandiose degree enough that we can see ministries develop. But anyhow, there's a gift of of interpretation and there's a ministry of interpretation just like there's a gift of prophecy and there's a gift and there's a ministry of prophecy the gift of interpretation you speak in tongues you give the interpretation that's the operation of the gift the gift of interpretation you speak in tongues you interpret what first Corinthians 14 5 says you know would y'all speak in tongues ready to prophesy for greater is he that prophesied that he that speaks with tongues, except he interpret. In other words, the one that spoke in tongues is the one that interprets. And we get that. We understand that. And this is done in the church. So you can speak in tongues and you can interpret. And so if you're operating in that, and if you stand up and you feel the Spirit of God on you, and you begin to speak in that tongue, and there's a word, a burning word that bubbles within you to speak, then you give the interpretation. If not, just wait. And maybe God has an interpretation from someone else. Maybe someone might know that language. Maybe, maybe, and then someone will have that interpretation. Okay, if they don't, then speak in tongues again and see if God will give you the interpretation. Bada bang. But let's allow, let's allow room for the Holy Spirit to move in this. And again, the problem was that the people were doing it. You know, the problem is how many of them were doing it and, one of the, and, and why they were doing it. So look. Let's let these things be done decently and in order. And that's the whole premise of this. So we've already gone through about how to interpret tongues in your private life. It's no different. But this is where we begin to learn the foundations of how the Holy Spirit leads us in these different ways. And I'm telling you, tongues, diverse tongues was a big stepping stone for me. Because I didn't separate the difference between prayer and the Spirit and diverse tongues. But when I saw diverse tongues different than just prayer in tongue, praying in the Spirit, I began to understand the great power and diversities of tongues and it being languages of men or of angels. I tell you, just recently I was in a serious prayer meeting with Yeshua ben Yahweh. And it got very, very voluminous, loud. And you know, I think that in our Sabbath days, we should go get to a place where we can pray and be as loud as we want to, and, or as quiet as we want to. Maybe you don't have a place where you can go get loud, but I'll tell you what, the louder you get, the bolder you'll become. I believe that the devil has put us in houses and has tried to squish our faith in these ways, but we need to get outside and we need to be vociferous in these things. But when it comes to being aggressive, about these. It says again in 1 Corinthians 14, 13, if any man is zealous for spiritual matters, seek that you may excel to the edifying of the church. That's what we're all about. And interpretation of tongues is for service. It's for service. It's speaking words to people. I've seen it operated in great ways. I've seen a man speak in tongues and his wife interpret and heal people. I've seen people speak in tongues and give the interpretation. People get healed left and right. I've seen one person speak in tongues and give the interpretation and somebody across the room knew it. You say, well, that sounds like the gift, not the ministry. God can do what he wants to do. I've seen someone speak in tongues and someone give the interpretation and a man in the back say, I know exactly what that interpretation was and what he said was exactly right because I know that language. Because I've been privileged to travel for people or not, uh, or, or more than bilingual. So, you know, as we begin going into this whole idea of interpreting of tongues in the church, we have this example that we recorder from our last class of, of people that were inspired to do this. You know, if you just remember, love is the great law, right? 
And this is why 1 Corinthians 13 is sandwiched right between 12 and 14. If you're just walking in love, you don't need all the laws, man. You know, if you just walk in love, okay? And, uh, and there is order in the church, and there's authorities in the church, and there's people that have ministries, there's prophets in the church, there's apostles, and there's, ch ch there's church pastors. You know, it, but this is for the edification of the church, not for the control. And so I pray that the Holy Spirit li be liberated in you to receive this gift in an abundant flow in your prayer closet. And then as you do this and you, as you hear these examples, if you would like to join in some practice groups, it's amazing we can do this by chat rooms. And uh, if you'd like to be involved in some of these and sharpen your skills in some of this, but better still, why don't you order the book? and the DVDs, and the books, and get a bunch of people together and learn how to speak by the Spirit of God. Again, it's been a blessing to share with you these things. I want to tell you that the Lord is really directing me apostolically in this. Thank you for the considerations that you've given me. In short synopsis, I believe the foundation of interpretation of tongues is in the prayer closet. I think the extenuating circumstances of the errant practices in Corinthians caused Paul to correct this, but the doctrine of this is that interpretation of tongues is the interpretation of tongues. That whatever tongues is, interpretation can be. I am very poised in telling you that these are serious weapons for, for warriors. These are serious weapons for intercessors. You know, diversities of tongues, as 1 Corinthians 12, 28 says, is the foundation of the entire church. If you're an intercessor and you're not operating in diversities of tongues, would you please get my book and learn about it? I love you for your dedication, but you're, don't be, you, there's no sense in digging a ditch with a shovel if there's a steam hoe or a backhoe. So please, get your tools. We have some amazing things in front of us, even right now, timing this in our election year. The Tongues of the Interpretation that works with principalities and powers. You know, these are the trumpets, you see? That's why it says, sounding brass or tinkling cymbal, if you have not love, but you get in love for God, you become a very powerful person. You know, and, and you know, the power that emanates from you is from the one and self same spirit that distributes all these gifts. So why be strong only in prophecy or in word of wisdom or healing? What about interpretation of tongues that Jesus Christ gave his life to give these last two gifts to the church? So there are gifts of interpretation, and, and that could, can be done in your private prayer law closet. There's a gift to be done. Speak in tongues and interpret in the church as a gift. And there's also a ministry of interpretations where people, other people speak in tongues and interpret. You'll hear lessons of this as we go to this cut and paste or this next session of it. 